all set, we'll get started. So we have Jay with us and we've gone through this a little bit. And from what I can see, there's two questions that we have to answer before we go too far. One is, can we have oyster farming in the Park River? Will it, you know, will it fit? Do we have the environment for it? Do we have the places for it? And then the other part of the question is, do we, does the town want to have oyster farming in the river? So I think the fish commissioners can address the can, and I think the town has to address whether they want it or not. So we're going to start off tonight with uh, with Jay's uh, production here, and then I was going to have the selectman ask questions. We only have one. Then the harbor master, then the fish shellfish warden, fish commissioners in the audience, and we'll go through and get some stuff answered up and. Um, We'll go from there. All right, you got it. All right, well, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, again, my name is Jay. I have an oyster company. It's called Fat Dog Shellfish. It's up in Great Bay. I'll tell you a little bit of how I, in Southern New Hampshire, I'll tell you a little bit about how I landed in Great Bay. I actually live in Newburyport. I've lived in, on the North Shore for most, well, about 25 years now, I'm 46, so more than half of my life. Um, and so I'm really interested in trying to find a place around here um, where we can grow some oysters. And as you probably know, between Duxbury and Great Bay, there's no oyster aquaculture. So that I think there's a real opportunity there. Uh, it's a great way to demonstrate a sustainable business. So this is the area I've kind of identified. I'll walk you through the steps um, that I went through to find that spot. Um, I know this is a long game, you know, we've been talking about this. This is not something I'm in a big rush to do. Happy to work with the town and um, everything is kind of adaptable. I, you know, I've got plenty to do up on my farm in New Hampshire, but again, this is long term. You know, if I, my kids get into oyster farming, it would be cool to do it more locally. So we talked a little bit about my background. Uh, I've worked in natural resource management for uh, about 20 years. Uh, I worked for the state for most of those. I went to Gordon College down in Wenham and studied marine biology there. I worked at Crane Beach right out of college for a guy named Dave Rimmer, who probably some of you probably know, and that, those are probably the three best summers of my life because I lived on the property and I had keys to all the gates and I just uh, fished like crazy. It was pretty awesome. Uh, I've worked with some local committees like the Eight Towns and the Great Marsh Committee with Jeff. So. I'm really connected to this area, really love it, uh, and I, I love working here. Um, so uh, in 2011, uh, I was mentioning we were given some grants to some towns on the South Shore, uh, and I got to know a bunch of oyster farmers. Long story short, I approached a friend of mine uh, and said, hey, let's get out of this state government business and start an oyster farm, probably on a, a frustrating day. Uh, and we we decided that we were gonna together look for a spot um, to farm oysters. So some of the things that you look for, you're probably familiar with. It's not too different from a good place to clam or to try to grow clams. I mean, basically oysters like an estuarine environment, uh, to farm there, you want it to be pretty well protected. Uh, relatively firm substrate is good, but really what you're trying to do is match um, match your gear to the habitat type that you have landed in. So there's a lot of flexibility really as long as you're in an estuarine environment. Even in really deep water now you can use floating gear, um, but I think the probably the intertidal to shallow subtidal sites are really the best. Access is a major consideration. You want to be, you know, have some access points that allow you to get to your farm and you're moving a lot of gear around and kind of uh, harvest and sell your, your product, of course. So we, uh, we had our, my business partner at the time was living in Topsfield. I was living in Newburyport then. Um, and we looked all over the North Shore uh, to find a spot to farm oysters. Most of you, or I'm sure you're all familiar with these uh, DMF shellfish suitability maps. 
The green areas are open for harvesting, so no rainfall closures there. Yellow are conditionally approved and red is prohibited. So it looks like we have a lot of green on the North Shore from Cape Ann to the New Hampshire border, but once we zoom in a little bit, you find that we're in conditionally approved waters uh, in the estuaries, which, which is okay. You know, you, you can make that work. Uh, where we are in New Hampshire, we're also conditionally approved. So long story short, uh, we, we were at it for about six months, I would say, kind of looking at the various towns along the North Shore and came up empty. Uh, and my first idea was to try to do something in the mouth of the Merrimack. Uh, at that time, the mouth of Merrimack was completely closed, and now it's conditionally restricted the classification, so stuff can go from there, clams can go from there to the depuration plant, as you're familiar with. Uh, I'm not sure if they're doing oysters there yet or not, but I, it, there, there are some branding issues that go along with a depurated product, so uh, branding and pricing that goes along, along with that. Um, so here, here are some of the spots that we looked at. I won't get into all the details of why we kind of abandoned them. Another area that we thought was promising was Plum Island Sound, just because of that protection. Uh, the bottom type in a lot of areas are good. But as soon as you overlay the refuge system, you, uh, you see that a lot of that just goes away. Uh, the refuge system is kind of weird about aquaculture. They will tell you, uh, at Parker River that that's completely off limits to aquaculture. In Maine, they have allowed some aquaculture in the refuge system. Is that Rachel Carson? No. Rachel Car Carson has a few that's oyster right. farms. Yep. Uh, and the, I believe the rule is that you, uh, you have to be below mean low water and you can't touch the substrate or something like that. Mm. So there's, it, it's not easy. It's a, mm. So I, I believe those are all floating gear uh, systems. So while we were kind of looking around the North Shore, we came upon this publication out of the University of New Hampshire where they had done a site suitability analysis for oyster aquaculture in Great Bay. Uh, and so that kind of caught our attention. And at the same time, the Nature Conservancy up there was really promoting oyster aquaculture as a way to clean up Great Bay, which is like most estuaries, a eutrophic system. It has too, much, too many nutrients, too much algae. So we started poking around up there a little bit. We met with UNH, we met with the state and TNC, and we thought it was just kind of a lower hanging fruit. It was gonna be easier to get something going there uh, than, than on the North Shore. And they had already permitted a few farms there. So my farm was actually number four uh, in New Hampshire, and there were a couple of <coughs> small farms operating. So if you're not familiar with Great Bay, uh, here's, here's 95. You go over the Piscataqua River, hang a left. This is about seven miles up and around the corner. Uh, this is the Oyster River in Durham. So the University of New Hampshire is up here. If you look at an aerial, uh, P, this is Pease, and the, um, the trade port is right in this area. So just, just to get your geographic bearings. So this is the first site that we permitted. This is four acres. We operate out of Great Bay Marine, which is here. And it's very expensive to operate out of a marina, as you can imagine. There's no cut rate deals for, um, for aquaculture. And this is our second site. This, this site is in full production. So I was mentioning we will do about a quarter million oysters this year out of this crop all came out off of this four acre site. And that, that site's pretty packed. So that's probably a good measuring stick for what kind of productivity a three to four acre site could, could produce. This site is all uh, subtitle. Uh, you can see everything we do is kind of aboard a boat and I'll plug in a, into some details. And then this other site is actually more like the site I've been eyeing in the Parker. It's uh, intertidal, very shallow subtitle, so you can actually walk around it. So this is the type of gear that I want to experiment with there, where you can just kind of walk around it and move stuff around. And I'll, I'll talk more about gear in a sec. Uh, so three major components of our operation in New Hampshire. The first is nursery, nursery culture, so how to buy seed and grow seed out. 
uh, the full grow out. So from about thumbnail size, about one centimeter to market size is what I'm talking about when I refer to uh, grow out. And then of course, harvest and sales and, and how we do that. So this, is, this system is called a floating upweller. And this is actually at a slip at the marina. When these doors are closed, it looks like, a, is everyone familiar with an upweller or for the most part? Um, so essentially we buy seed oysters which look like this, they're terrifyingly small when we get them. We put them in these silos and there's screens that sit on the bottom, the oysters sit on the bottom. <clears throat> we pump water out of this trough in the middle and that draws water up past the oysters and kind of force feeds the oysters. And you can do that for clams or uh, a, bunch of, a bunch of shellfish. So we have one of these uh, at the dock. We ran two for a while because we were selling more seed and we scaled back at that. But an upweller like this is capable of producing about 1.5 million oysters. So you can, you can grow quite a bit or get quite a bit started uh, in this size upweller. This is a bag of oyster seed. There are uh, half a million oysters in this bag. Um, and that half a million oysters cost us about $5,000. So it's terrifying. They, come, they ship them FedEx, uh, packed on ice, and we get a box that's worth $10,000 and has a million and a half oysters in it. Uh, season one, uh, this is what the babies look like when we get them. They're 1.5 millimeters. We call them pepper flakes. Uh, after about five or six weeks in the upweller, they grow to thumbnail size and they're going from that one liter sock to about 150 liters when they're this size. So that upweller goes from barely being able to find your oysters to just being packed with, with oysters. And then we move them out to the farm at this size and we put them in uh, mesh bags. And then by the end of the first summer, they're about this size. They're about a quarter to, if you're lucky, a half dollar size. So that's season one, and that's nursery culture. Uh, once they go to the farm, they go out in these mesh bags. We have a tray system. They're called oyster condos, where the bags just slide into the trays, and then we can use the crane to lower them to the bottom. Uh, and then once they're about an inch, they start to go into these stacking trays. And the stacking trays look a lot like this, but it would be like uh, three tiers of this type of a tray. And then once, once they're in this, um, they grow out to maturity. So really the key to oyster farming is moving the line. So you have to constantly be touching, grading oysters and moving them onto bigger and bigger mesh size so they get more flow because they're in this contained environment. If you keep them in a too small mesh container, the, the water just goes around them. They're obviously filter feeding. Uh, and so they're, they're not gonna grow. So twice each year, we try to move them, chip them and move them onto a bigger screen size. And you can kind of see, here's one of those stacking trays here. Here's our pontoon boat with a crane mounted on it. Uh, this is a tumbler that we use, and it's both a uh, tumbler that's used to chip the edges of the oyster. And if you, chi if you chip them, they have a better shape and more consistent uh, shape and cup, a deeper cup. If you just let them go without, um, without chipping them, they're long and skinny and flat and not really attractive to a restaurant. So this does that as we're running through it, but it also sorts them. So we know that oysters falling through these holes go into one mesh size. These these holes go in one, one mesh size, and usually the stuff coming out of the end is just about ready to go to market, so that sorter. I wanted to just draw your attention to the backdrop here. This is actually a farm down in Barnstable, I think. Obviously, one of the big issues with oyster farming is visual impacts when it comes to butters. So this is kind of what a farm, I think at the scale we're talking about, looks like. Um, with the, and these are the three, two or three tier stacking trays. So you see it, I mean, it's not, it's out there and that, that's something that uh, can hang oyster farms up quite a bit. Um, so these are our oysters at a place called the East Coast Grill that used to be in Cambridge. Um, but we do a lot of direct sales. We sell to a bunch of restaurants right around here. We do a lot of business with Sea Level uh, Oyster Bar up in Newburyport. Uh, Newburyport Fish buys them from us. But we have about 15 customers from 
uh, Portland to Boston is kind of where we sell. And then I sell to JP's Shellfish also um, for kind of nationwide distribution. So I like to keep the local market for myself as my business model. And then JP's kind of buy stuff for cheap for me, but they ship it, ship it out of town. Uh, and that we have a nice balance that way. Uh, so in terms of business and operations, we have two year round full-time employees and that includes me and I have one other guy that's my farm manager who works with me year round. And then in the summer we're just jamming because the oysters are growing and we need to be chipping and sorting and harvesting. Uh, then I have four or five seasonal staff. And it's usually college kids that are interested in, in aquaculture and they, they come you know, right after school ends and they stay with me into the fall a little bit. Uh, one boat and tender, so I have the main pontoon boat with a crane and then I have a boat that I just use to run back and forth. This is just to give you a sense of the scale. This is our work platform. As I mentioned, we can't just walk around. Rarely can we walk around our gear so all of our work happens on this 36 foot barge that, that's on a mooring out there. And then I mentioned that floating up water system. So uh, there's, there really are a lot of benefits to oyster farming. I mean, the UNH was promoting it and TNC as a way to clean up uh, kind of the eutrophied waters. Since oyster farming has taken off in Gray Bay, there are about 15 farms now. There has been this huge range expansion of eelgrass, which depends on clean water. And this is all just corollary. It's not confirmed scientifically that that's why it's happened. Um, when I first started, we never saw overset on our oysters. We never saw baby oysters. And now it's a real problem for us. Um, we, we get baby oysters that set on our market oyster shells and we actually have to clean them up before we go. So all of our oysters that we buy are spawning oysters. So we see them spawning in the summer months and they're kind of contributing to that local oyster population. Uh, I just think it's a more balanced system now, um, and it's a, just a rare example of an industry that's really sustainable, I think. So, so pretty, pretty psyched, and that's one of the reasons I got into the business. Um, sustainability, we use very little fuel. We use about three to five gallons a week um, with our boat just running back and forth. Doesn't include driving the oysters around to where they want to go, but in terms of farm operations, Everything is solar powered, except for our boat, the tumbler, our wash down systems, and our pumps. Um, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, the, the gallons of fuel. So it's just, it's just a great example of kind of a, low, a real low impact. If you can get over visual impacts and things like that and kind of sharing the, the river, uh, it's a real low impact system. That's all I wanted to say about my operation. Does anybody have any questions on that before I move on to the Parker? I have a last on the, on the Parker. No? Okay. So as I mentioned, we've got a real connection to this area. This is our little whaler at, at Riverfront with my wife. Um, there's a lot of reasons that I'm interested in farming in the Parker. The biggest one is probably to diversify. Um, as you know, you know, state rules can change, things can come up. There can be oil spills, so to have all of your oysters in one spot is always a dangerous thing. Another key to marketing oysters is to have a new product every now and then because restaurants will get tired of your product and people, you know, having the same oyster on the menu. So being able to offer new products is huge, you know, lo local connections, I guess. And uh, I think an intertidal farm like this could be all solar, could get rid of gas gas engines all together, which would be really awesome, I think, and a great, great marketing tool also. So we've kind of been looking at this map a little bit. This is the area that we're talking about. This is the refuge boundary, which kind of takes all this out of play. This is the DMF closure line, which we, we were talking with Pete that, that there's possibility that that could change. But that leaves what I think currently is the only sliver on the Parker that's uh, available for uh, an effort like this. <coughs> just zooming in a little bit, this is Cottage Road. So it looks almost like Marine Fisheries just drew, extended the line from Cottage Road. So a lot of these lines are kind of arbitrary, I met. Um, so one of the issues is bacteria. 
The other is uh, the discharge from the governor's academy. And I think dye testing has shown that based on that discharge, the line would be way further back. So I think that's a non-issue. That's now going through a treatment plant, you know, right? Yeah. Okay. So there, yeah, there are standard, I think it has secondary treatment and there are standards for that and they have to do dye testing, but I think it's good. It's the, the long and short. Uh, so there it is again. I don't think there's anything else I wanted to say here. Just zooming in a little bit. So all of this, I think, I mean, you tell me, I think is um, weightable probably for three hours around the low tide or even more. So I think in terms of servicing gear, um, if you can get over there, it's, it's, a, it's a good spot. I think, um, I think I have another slide on what, what makes it good. Oh, here we go. So that polygon that I showed is just over three acres. Um, the, the substrate is nice and firm. Um, based on my review of Google Earth historic maps, looks like it hasn't changed in a long time. Jeff, you, you said it was uh, maybe growing. It's protected. It's just a good spot. It would be a really good spot. I think the water's the water gets really warm there. Based on the fouling on the bottom of my whaler, which grows barnacles, the water in New Hampshire where we are is too fresh for barnacles. So I know it's it's real salty water, and that makes oysters taste better, in, in my opinion. Um, so there are just uh, and there are some access points nearby. So in terms of grow out methods, um, you know, starting from seed to market, uh, seed has to come from a hatchery that's approved by uh, marine fisheries. That includes Muscungus Bay, which is up in Bremen, Maine, and on the Damaris, or north of the, the uh, Damariscata, where we currently buy our seed, and that does real well for us. Um, Cage culture, I think, is the way to go there. Um, I just don't really like floating gear because you can always see it. There's just no, no escaping. And it's also uh, not a really efficient way to use space. You need more space for, for floating gear. Another possible method is to spread the oysters directly on the substrate, and they grow really fast that way if you can get a good spot for it but I almost think the system is too dynamic, like the sand might move around too much. And winter is a big issue. If they're exposed, they, they can die on a really cold, cold night. So I think the production potential of that three acres is around 250,000. If you fully built it out, probably around 250,000 oysters a year, which is kind of where you need to be to pay the bills. Um, Anything smaller than that is really kind of a hobby farm that's just just scraping by. Uh, in terms of permitting, so the shellfish planting guidelines, I think are the best source. You can find these online. There's a nice review of what the permitting process is like. Pete, you already know more about that process with the state than I do. Uh, but essentially, it starts with the town. <clears throat> BMF needs a letter from the Board of Selectmen to uh, start the process of going out, looking at the site, and making their determination. Um, <clears throat> there's lots of layers here. Uh, U.S. Army Corps permit, if you have gear out there, you need uh, a wetlands permit from them, uh, state permits, uh, Conservation Commission gets involved if there's structures. And I believe because, maybe you know about this, Jeff, but because this is within an ACEC, the farm would have to go through NEPA review, which is courtesy of my old boss, Bruce Carlisle. I think he, he really pushed for that. So there's, there's years of permitting, or I would say if, we're, if you just were like, yes, we love this, I think just to go through the rest of that process would be a year and hopefully wouldn't necessarily involve consultants. I uh, wanted to come back to visual impacts because that's the one that kills most oyster farms. Um, some guys will go to the mat, you know, and hire lawyers if the neighbors come out against it and hate it. That's it's not where I am, just, just so you know. Um, but I just want to be clear that there, there's no, no hiding this once it's out there. Uh, 
One of the main challenges I mentioned for me is my dock, my boat at the dock, um, winter. So what I think has to happen at this site is that all the oysters have to get pitted, which means you find a root cellar somewhere, you take them out in December, everything you have out in December, put them in bags, and you put them in a, some, some type of a pit. And basically what you're looking for is a consistent temperature in the high 30s and humidity and those oysters will live forever uh, as long as they're dormant. So you put them in a pit, keep them there until April, and then once the weather starts to warm up, you move them back out and then they wake up and start start feeding again. So I don't have a place to do that at my house. I imagine there's something around, but that's, that's a question for another day, I think. Uh, I think there could be a lot of local benefits. I mean, this is, you know, oyster farms are really a, a great part, in my opinion, of a working historic waterfront. I know uh, clams are big in Newbury and all over the North Shore. I think oysters could kind of help uh, round out the, the shellfish business and culture uh, in Newbury. They're good for the environment. They just are. They, they soak up a lot of extra nutrients. Um, they create habitat. And I think there are opportunities to do things like a put and take type of a thing where you know some percentage could be grown for recreational harvest and things like that. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of kind of a dynamic range of, uh, of benefits and things that can be done. There has been quite a bit of work, I won't go through these studies, on Plum Island Sound and the Parker River, some of which I participated in when I worked for the state. And it's, it's a, like just about every estuary. I mean, it's eutrophic. There, there are too many nutrients. Um, shellfish in general are part of the answer for that, not the whole answer, um, but oysters are super efficient at soaking up those extra nutrients like we're seeing up in, uh, in Great Bay. So, so I, I'm, I'm fully committed to the oyster farming thing. I mean, I'm committed up in New Hampshire. Um, you know, my whole professional career has really, I've tried to make it about sustainability and I feel re really good about what I'm doing and I, I hope we can expand it somewhere nearby. I think that's all I have. That's it. Super. Thanks for listening. We'll start with you, Mr. Chairman, ex-chairman. I'll give you back to Sir Austin. Um, Uh-oh. What's the matter? I lost my AV, but oh, it's back. Okay. There's a lot of moving parts. I want to um, compliment the clam commission and everyone involved here today to even take a step to look at things like this. A lot of it is concern of what might, might occur with the change in regulations that your friends from Oyster Bay or Oyster, what is it now? Waste of what down there in the Cape, down at uh, Duxbury? Oh, Island Creek. Island Creek. Oh, Friday with the yeah, oyster initiative. So, yeah. Um, I had mentioned when you came along to Peter that, you know, Jay is a good guy. He's trustworthy. He's worked hard. Certainly, anyone, if anyone else, he could enter into the permitting process with ease and be able to move forward if it's something that the town found that something that he started that benefited him and made him a year's pay and employed people and other things and helped our town and did anything and was something that we wanted to enter into and the fact that it might talk about cleaner water, sustainability and all the other things, if it's something we decided it would be good for that sliver of land and could it open up other land. And I, I'm amazed that in that management plan for the refuge that they can walk out all that acreage to agriculture. But it's just the way it is. Yeah. But that's a decision that comes more, he would be, what I'm saying to you is he would be a good trusted partner to push forward if it's something we wanted to do to go against marine fisheries and all the other per permitting issues that could, be looming on the horizon, especially if, <coughs> what is the um, organization's name now? MSI. The MSI dictates to us we don't have any control <clears throat> over our town waters anyway. 
That's the Mass Shellfish Initiative? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So that's kind of looming behind a lot of our decision making too. Mm -hmm. You know, when this all came up and your name came forward, if anyone's going to help us make these steps, I would say to the guys, you're a trusted guy and you know the ropes from an agency side. So, you know, it has to be something that benefits the town. It has to be something that's sustainable. To me, it would be also something that could be passed on to some of the other guys if they wanted to give you the industry some other place in town, you would have to help them. Mm -hmm. So, There aren't many places in town. I know that. <laughs> Notice that it's a little tiny yeah. I know area. That. I know that. Right. But, but I'm wondering how that has to be because Peter's been trying to open up above anyway. So yeah, we, we worked hard. I, I mentioned that, that, that we've been pushing, Paul and I have been going out on the water tests and I mean, Kennedy said three to five years, it's been five years. And when I talked to Devin the last time I went out on the water test, she didn't say the water's bad. She just said, I'm, I'm too busy to put the data together to open that those flats. So that's that. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, those are all great points, Jeff, and I'm, uh, I'm happy to be patient and work with you. I have to be careful about I get I have permits from DMF for distributing oysters. So I have to be careful about how much you know. You know what? <laughs> we might have to, but yeah. the the best way to I think to force the issue with them is to say we want to go through this process, you know, and it's going to take extra time because it's the first time through. But you force their hand a little bit, you know. There there's a process that's in place, and we can make them walk through that process by having the selectmen say, hey, this is something we want to pursue and that you know sets all the wheels in motion it doesn't have to be adversarial necessarily but then then people have to start at they have to start at answering the big questions about whether this can be permitted and what it looks like for Newbury just like with your history with your agency Jeff Kennedy's not going to be there forever we've had people retire we before we're going to have a new person in charge of marine fisheries um, I think sitting back and not doing anything to push forward the things that we need in our town that the folks that are clamming and might have any other designs, I think the people, and, and it might be good for everyone and then forward to get together, you know, if you have a presence with the fisheries as it changes leadership, you're going to be in a better position to get some of the things that you might need going forward. Because there's certainly going to be some changes there. Yeah, and it's yeah, and it, that's going to happen in the short term too, Jeff. Because Chris Scalacci yeah. just left, yeah. and he was on board. You know, when I talked yeah, to him, Kennedy's got three years, and what's his name? Dan's going to take over. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, it's and, just uh, going to be Mike a Hickey big. Is it's going to be a little bit of a show. Yeah. So maybe that. I mean, maybe that's a good thing. You yeah. know, it's changes. Uh, can be good. Jay, is your proposal out of water at low tide? Yes. It's, you're part of that sandbar. Yeah. It's loaded with people every Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's those people are really going to want to vote. You have questions you want to, we want to go to your popular spot. That, that would be a public hearing. That's a very that, popular spot. That's a public yeah. hearing thing, you know, and that's yep. going to be tough. Yeah, and so, I mean, so, yeah, here it is. You can see there's boats here, right? And there's a lot of flat left, you know. It's not like it takes up the whole thing. It's all scalable too, you know, if you just want to go through the process and try to get an acre or something like that. And oh, the other thing I didn't mention is the, the tourism part of this. I mean, the oyster <coughs> tourism is huge in Duxbury now. I mean, they just load up boats and drive them around all those oyster farms. All right, we're out then, forget it. They don't have greenheads down there, do they? Yeah. No, that's, that's, that keeps that, the tourists away. That almost made me not go down this road. It's greenhead season, it's like the height of the season. I can't imagine what mm -hmm. that would be. I've got a question for you that's not uh, Harbor master related, but one that I just thought of seeing that picture. And I'm not an attorney, a land attorney, but don't people own to the low water mark on their property? And I'm looking at low water mark and you're technically on Fred Thurlow's land. Yeah, I'm assuming you are. I don't know how much he owns, but um, 
That's a great well, question. So what would, hear about this. Yes. Well, that's yeah. what I, I, that, I'm just bringing it up because I think it would be brought up if yeah. that's the case. You no, know, and when I talked to uh, Kennedy on the phone the other day about this, he, he told me that he said, "Do not use Ipswich as a model." He said they were terrible, and what they did was they they designated areas that could be farmed, and then they permitted them, and then they left the farmer to negotiate with the owner of the land, and. Well, what was the town down the Cape, Paul, that we were looking at the regulations? No. What was it? Bonstable. Bonstable. And he recommended that we look at Bonstables. He said they, they were the best in the state. But you're right. If it's private property, That's a it can be a problem. So I looked at the parcel maps, and I don't know how accurate they are, but it looked to me like the parcels ended at the edge of the marsh here. Basically, um, but yeah, I, I, I'm surprised it would only because I I always thought just because a family member had waterfront property that they were told they owned to the low water mark. Yeah. Well, so the other, well, what, is, what are riparian rights too? Well, Does that mean they own out into the river? We're one of the five low water states. Now, that's certainly in all coastal areas, unless we've given it away as an easement for putting sand on the beach like we did on Plum Island. But the whole end, the whole southern end of the Plum Island, you know, the colonial ordinance, they own to low water, not high water. Right. Because we're as five coastal states. Okay. Now, you're right, Jim, and I don't know how that works, but, uh, you know, Kennedy seemed to think, I don't know how that he heads up in the riparian side of things it's certainly coastal um, i just brought it up because i think it, it let's say that's the case worst yeah. case scenario for you <laughs> right. then well then nobody's you, going there right well that's right. an island yeah. well and so that's water, there's a sliver of water behind right too, so, so i'm, so I'm wondering if you define it. Yeah, yeah i'm wondering and it might be a legal question for the yeah. town um but i'm wondering if this would be the the, that's why the parcel is drawn, drawn that way because of this. Uh, sub, this is subtitle. We'll find so. out if Freddie thinks he owns it. I'll tell yeah. you what, that's kind of funny because what happens when the sandbar changes, you know? That, that, that's yeah. different every year. So. Yeah. Yeah. You, could, uh, you could tax more, on ba you could tax based on that sandbar. You could add that into the total. Totally. That, that's a great question. I hadn't fully uh, kind of digested yeah. that. Well, I just that's see that. And it's, it's a stumbling block, I yeah. think. But it, until it gets clarified. Yeah. What, what is the, just as a taxpayer, again, I'm not coming from the Harbor Masses Department, but what does the town get monetarily out of this? Do they get anything for this? It's up, to, up to the town. I mean, dip, you know, uh, some, I don't know, Pete, do you want to? No, I, I don't, I've looked at, at Ipswich's. That was the only one I looked at, the leases in Ipswich, and I think Catham, and it, not a ton of money. Yeah. I mean, I, it's like a hundred bucks or something for a, for a grant. The on there. Just you have the constables on here. Yeah, I even looked at you. Do they, do they actually get tax money from the? Not a lot. Not much. Yeah. Because well, I don't lease. They, they, they do a, a lease on the grant. I think is yeah, what they do. Because like if it's not Fred's land, mm -hmm. then it's the state's land. Right. Because it's the waterway. Right. And we pay, we pay small fees to the state. That's, okay. That's permitting. In New Hampshire, we pay. Two hundred dollars per acre per year, just for licensing. So about a thousand dollars for per year for for a four acre site, and then we pay a tax on each oyster sold of a penny and a half. Yep. So, so those are fifteen hundred dollars per hundred thousand oysters sold. Plus you would have to pay other. whatever the fees the the clamp. Wouldn't you need a shellfish license in Newbury to to do this? I don't know. Is that yeah, more? Yeah. Well, we make one. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have one. We don't have a oh. commercial oyster yeah, license. We don't have okay. one. We don't have one. Non resident. I'm sure that there the yeah. will be one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I got my checkbook all warmed up. Right? Did Great Bay sell you the product being a non resident of this state? Yes. Did they allow. They have a resident? Yep. Yeah. They allow non residents. Yeah, they, uh, I think, I actually think they're doing it right up there because. You know, anytime you yeah, you know, non-resident, you would think that. Well, of course, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, from a business perspective, so licenses in Great Bay are fully transferable. Uh, 
which means I can actually sell my business, right? And and that's so rare. I mean, Massachusetts, it rarely happens where you can transfer. And that's something that, that I think is coming up through that MSI is transferability because it just kills the value of your business if you're not able to transfer it. And you you just come out behind almost every time in aquaculture. But the town could end up having uh, the guy from Duxbury come up and buy you out and then start suing all the abutters because they got deep pockets. Right. So it may not be something that... Yeah. I, I, we may not have a choice. You're right. The, the state may change the law, but... Yeah, so typically <laughs> town, I mean, towns wouldn't allow that, right? They wouldn't allow a transfer. I mean, I would always push for that from a business you know, perspective. Yeah, I understand. It's worth more money. Um, but a lot the towns that do allow transfers will rehear the license. Right. So they'll allow it to be bought and sold, but it has to go through the public hearing has to process. Go through the town. Like, a, yeah. like a like a license. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Paul, you got any questions? No, they were kind of what the guys were saying. I have, well, I have just a couple more. Going, yeah. Yeah. yeah, one of them is more to benefit you. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got the a boat and a barge. Yep. Uh, as a non-resident, you wouldn't be able to use the town ramp. What I think you should do is speak to the selectmen to see if we can get a bylaw change. And what I think is a good thing just for the town is anybody that owns a business in town mm -hmm. should also be allowed to buy a, a, a ramp permit. Because I've got several of the guy post fly on Route 1, would love to have one. Um, so I think we should make that, uh, that, I'm just recommending that that change should be made and that would benefit you greatly because now you're not paying, I hate to say it because I like Dave Moulton, but you're not paying his his uh, dock space fee, which yeah. is thousands of dollars compared to right. four, three bucks a foot, which yeah. is pretty cost effective. So that's something that you might want to look into. I appreciate that yep. very much. Uh, and I think it's doable and you'd have my vote for it if I had any input on it, but I think it's more the selectmen that would, because it's a bylaw change that would have to be made. Uh, so then the only issue I got with respect to the Harbor Masters Department is, and we already touched on it, you're real close to where the channel is. All your work's going to be done at low tide, which yep. is the one time of the tide that all my customers are going to want to use that area mm -hmm. because that's where the only deep water is. Yep. Uh, it changes every year, but for the last three years, the best water is hugging that coastline. Mm -hmm. And yeah. yeah, and and it's the only water. Yep. And it, even to do that, to cut across from where you see all the boats moored, and let's say we're going out yep. to the ocean, you got to hook a hard right to get over there. Mm -hmm. That's even a tough one sometimes, where you got a foot of water. I bump in my fifteen yeah. foot whaler. Yeah. So yeah. so uh, I'll throw this out there, and it's probably nothing you can do anyway. But one thing I could see to get around that would be. Uh, as a business so that we wouldn't have any issues with all the customers that we have that own boats in the river. Uh, would you be willing to help out or pay for some sort of a dredging just just in that area so that we wouldn't have to deal with it? So mm -hmm. that, uh, I mean, I know that would be I mean, expensive. Couple, but I'm just, have yeah, it couple does, acres. But it's the only way I can see around it. Yeah. And again, the shovel well. being, there, being there is... is, is not the same as looking at a picture. We right. might be, if we go out there in the springtime and say, you know what, it's still navigable by all the boats, but I got to look at it safety wise yeah. with you out there with your barge and your crane. Am I going to have a problem with people that are trying to get in and out of right. the river you, or down to the marina? And it looks like I'm going to. How yeah. much work do you do on the weekends? Uh, That's the. Right. We're in the summer, we work every day. Yeah, yeah, so we're out that's there. what I assume. Yeah. And you're there at the worst time of the tide right. uh, for this channel. Yep. Yeah. Unfortunately. No, that I mean that's an issue. Um, you know, but there's no in Great Bay. There's no restrictions on use of these sites except the site that I have a license. No one else can farm oysters on uh, yeah. or take shellfish from. And so. do you have any trouble with poachers or? I don't really because I'm kind of in the mid, right in the middle of the bay, the way I'm set up. But the farms that are along the shoreline do have uh, problems with poachers, and it's just it's just yeah. a question of eyes on the water. Here, it'd be tough to get away with poaching without someone seeing you. Uh, I would think I would be more worried about uh, boat boat interactions with right. deer. 
So yeah. how much more is Paul's work going to increase the shellfish warden? Um, <laughs> yeah. In terms of eyes on the, the yeah, water? Yeah, I mean, or? yeah. You know, is he going to be spending more time out there, more time on the water because of that? Or? Is he going to start writing your checks, Paul? Yeah. yeah. I, I said it's warmed up. But... Charlie, you got questions? Or up? Anything? So am I as I get them. Where the, where the issue here too is, Great Day a long time ago because they've been able to harvest oysters there recreationally for a long time. Yep. Bought into oysters forever. And the idea with Fred Schott and all the guys from UNH with eelgrass and all the problems with some of the sewage treatment plants and everything else it was very easy to sell oyster farm. Well, you didn't think it was probably easy, but there was a leg up with all the spatial, with all the, you know, uh, amount of acreage they had and using oysters for all the good things. It was easy to bring in that type of atmosphere. We're so constricted down here. We have the public trust issues. Everyone's vying for the same space in our little river you would have to somehow, as Jim said in some ways too, and Peter kind of spoke, you, they would have to have real benefits for the town mm -hmm. in a lot of different ways and, and benefits also, not just for townspeople, but for our river. Yeah. And you would be the first to try to bring in that attitude of why would it be good for our marine environment because that was forged ahead for you a very long time ago by UNH and everyone else up at, at, at Great Bay. That's right, yeah. Yeah, the, those are great points, Jeff. I think it's the sustainability part and the ecological benefits. Those are pretty easy to get out there and enlist some local nonprofit groups to, you know, to help you spread that word. I think the harder question is what's in it for the town and maybe the more important question what what does the town get out of it and how do, how do you sell that you know and the shorter short answer is jobs and kind of the culture of a of a working waterfront um you know and there there are a number of other benefits so you have to you're right you got to hit it from a bunch of different directions and it's not it's not easy but the the town if the town is going to get on board you have to know going into it you know how does this benefit us and it comes back to well you're also going to have to um you know you talk with us and we think about the extending the, the variable that are going into it but you know it would take a, a public hearing mm -hmm. and those are the things that are going to be rising to the top in everyone's mind yep when the other selectmen sit there and everyone, you know, we're going to be hearing, what does this do for me but take away property that I want to put my boat on and how does it help us and the benefits are for the owner. Right. The, the, the town, the town yeah. as a rule, doesn't um, allow non-residents to yep. sell fish commercially. Maybe you could plant flowers and stuff on the top of them yeah. so okay. that when Fred looks out his window and <laughs> sees all the flowers yeah. and Pretty it much looks like cool at the bottom. You know, it's great. I, I had a picture in there of my daughter working the, the flat. That's that's the best picture ever. You know, it's like kids, kids getting out there, interacting with the environment. You know, the reality is, uh, you know, I don't want to promise too much. There's only so much I can do in terms of the marketing to make this happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there are probably some other groups out there that would be better at it than me that we could talk to if the town was excited about it. But I have... I have limited capacity, you know. Um, so, I I think I, I see how I kind of see how. When I say is, your dredge isn't working. My dredge is broken. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but, but don't um, don't I'm, give up. I, I tell you, yeah. when you told me that you could run these through the plant, that that opens up a whole new area for you. If yeah. that, you know, if that's the type of thing you want to look at, and then the other thing is upriver. So, right. So I'm not I'm not giving up, I, and I'm not saying that I I don't have any capacity to do some of this work, but I would I need the town as a partner. You know I couldn't do it in in isolation. You know I would yeah. need the town and the selectmen to like to be on board and like hey let's let's pursue this together. And there's the permitting side and interacting with the state side and the 
marketing side, and it doesn't all have to happen at once, but it's it mm-hmm. may happen at some point, you know, and it may may or may not be me. But Alan, you have a question? Come on, you're a smart guy. The one thing that I kind of like about it is kind of what you spoke about was the name, the marketing thing, given an area. Like you said, these people like these certain brands, like the Duxbury's or the Barnstable or whatever, right? You know yourself, they're like, oh, I don't want those ones. I want these ones. That would really boost the town name up. Especially maybe even with, not that we don't have a good tasting clam or name, but you know what I'm saying. Yep. It's, yeah. and I, I do know up at, in Maine that uh, some people opened up some different couple oyster places. They were small when I was there, but, you know, it kind of took off for them a little bit up there, you know. Yep. So the town of Duxbury is the best example. You know, they, the town itself has really used the kind of growth of the oyster farming industry as a marketing tool for the town. Right, and they there's actually I'll just I'll see if I can find it, but there was some article that came out um, that showed you know property values increasing. And there was a whole laundry list of mm-hmm. reasons why one of them that's kind of what I was proximity to oyster bit. farms, right? And so at you know at this scale, it's one you know three acres. It's probably it's not going to blow up like it did in Duxbury unless there's more water opening. But that whole local food, you know, this is the future of food. Aquaculture is, I believe, is the future of food. Um, and yeah, the town can use that for brand. And there, there's nothing else between Duxbury and Great Bay that's 120 miles. So it would be a, be a first for this entire area. So, so what, what was that? Um, some, some possibility of doing something to the plant? Was there some idea? Well, he's saying that, that they, they could run through the, the plant. plant which so I didn't know they yeah. could. what yeah. that does is it gives him more area because we own some land up there that he could possibly yeah. ha- harvest. So you're talking order- about using constriction, conditionally restricted water, right? right. To, right. To, to grow. Exactly. So you didn't mention that directly. So nice. this this right now is classified as prohibited. So this would have to be reclassified as conditionally restricted before. So that's what the Merrimack is, right? Parts of the Merrimack, I don't think I'd have a graph of that. Um, yeah, yeah, part, got more conditionally down restricted. there, you know, conditionally so restricted. No, nobody, nobody's going to like that. Using, using the waterways for these moorings, and that's, that's yeah. most of it for about a mile yep. to the yeah. west. But yeah. you know that. You know that. You do anything there, some, some people don't like it. Crab traps, eel traps. Yeah. Right, but above where we're trying to open up hackers. The, the old uh, by the train bridge? Yes. The high, high fat up, up this way. Yeah. If they open that, that will open the water from the bridge, or maybe even further than the bridge, all the way down. Season. No. We're, we're trying well, to open the boats in the marinas, though. They're going to argue against that. They'll, well, yeah, they'll make buffer zones around them. You're right. They probably won't. They told me they open it all the way down, but you're right. With the marinas there, they'll have a buffer around them. So we're, we're just trying to open the flat at the below the train bridge, but there's water above it too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and what happened? Do did the, did the governors change their water system from say ten years ago? Was there something different? They had they a do? direct pipe into the marsh years ago. They they got their own system. They now have a that. system. Do they have something different now? <laughs> no, I don't think so. But there is a thing. We went to a meeting and they wrote up a memorandum. Of understanding that no hasn't right. been out, and they were yeah. going to require Governor Dumma to notify the town within so many hours yeah. if they ever pump if they up. have to discharge. They, they, they never agreed to that, right? We don't. The state hasn't put it. The state something. hasn't put it in yet. You know, the state wrote it up. We were there at the meeting, and they were supposed to send it to Ipswich and uh, Newbury and Rowley. Nobody's seen it, so it's been written up. It just hasn't been. It's typical so state. That that's. Probably a condition to open that area, then, right? I don't think it. I don't think it is. I think the water's testing clean. I mean, if if you have a rainfall, you're going to automatically close it anyway. Yep. And if there's a discharge, if there's an accidental discharge, they got to let the town know. I mean, one of the things, as I'm sitting here because of some of the stuff I'm involved in, is just opening our minds to discuss things like with Jay is good, because. 
like Jim, when you were talking about Gretchen, I got involved in that regional Gretch effort yeah. with the uh, Woods Hole group, and they did the big study. And I mean, I was flabbergasted to find that right now in the state of Massachusetts, that if you haven't dredged an area for, you can't even get it dredged. So it's, it's when you allow moss to grow on your feet sometimes and you know don't look into some of the ways you might move forward in your estuaries. I mean, I know the refuge has some extreme, you know, we could lose, we could lose that from Island River. You guys all know because you're in it, but wow, is that getting shallow now. And I, I, I don't see any way you can dredge that. Um, I don't even think you can dredge that and make sure that it's well, going to stay open that. either. Right. It's it's just, it it every moves year. every winter. But yeah. if it hasn't been dredged before, it's a really dredge it. So another, I mean, you, you can go upriver and kind of force that issue, or you can force the issue a little bit with the refuge, you know, where there is precedent for aquaculture in refuge systems. What, you know, the answer I got was probably this is how I feel about it, but not a, yeah. a statutory answer right. necessarily. Maybe the town asking that question would get a, a more open answer. Well, it's just the fact that I think for the future of the people that use the water for their living in our town, that we should explore all avenues. I mean, you're coming in as a businessman to talk to us, but that doesn't mean that there won't be other businessmen in our town, you know, that might want to try something like this too. So, I mean, at least starting the ball rolling and you were nice I'm enough to come in. You know, three yeah, huh? No, but I'm, you know what, <laughs> the refuge, can be nudged, and oh, that's all up to and the what, director. And what yeah. Pete is trying to talk about is getting a whole that area town. that's testing clean, test clean. I tried that twice. For thirty years, yeah. we tried to put nets yeah. down there. They yeah. would never let. Yeah, us. but you know something. It's Mark, up to the director, though. I mean, yeah. a different direct, director could we, change his mind. Well, right. we have a different director coming in, and just like Rachel Carson, I mean, Rachel Carson is one of the strictest. You know, no pesticide, no hunting, no ain't nothing of it. Well, I guess they might do some hunting at Rachel Carson, but that's the, because of the name Rachel Carson, that's the strictest refuge I know of. Mm -hmm. And they allow certain kinds of agriculture. Any questions, Mr. Kimball? You have any questions? Yeah, we don't. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. You know, if there's anything we can do, Thanks for you coming. want to look. If you can find areas that look good to you and you want to let us know about it. And, yeah. You know, clam has been on the water his life. All the three of these guys have, they know the river, they know the splats. Um, they're good guys to talk to, a lot of info. If we can help you, we definitely will. I appreciate it. That's great. And, you know, like I said, if you want to take any, even of the smallest steps to, you know, look into this further, you know, uh, I can be your your guinea pig, you know, your your interested uh, private business party. I, I can help kind of go through the process a little bit, but you know, yeah, no, we have a lot to talk about. What, what's the best growing conditions for the oyster? What temperature? I know you uh, said the summer, but well, so the, I mean, they they grow as you know all the way from the Gulf Coast up to Nova Scotia. So, you know. Each each step down the coast you take is another year, basically, of of grow out for us mm -hmm. here. It's about three se three full season grow out, but the oysters taste better down on the Gulf Coast, so we get a better price. Down on the Gulf Coast, the oysters taste like shit uh, mm -hmm. for half half of the year, and maybe one month a year they they taste okay. Mm -hmm. So they grow them out in a year, but they get a a terrible price so I couldn't couldn't tell you what the best condition for the best taste the, the colder the water the better yeah. substrate is sandy best or is it just can you put it's it on? just figuring out how to use the substrate you have where I am it's real mucky uh, bottom and I, I didn't think that would be great um, but actually what happens in the winter for us is the oysters get silted in they get the, the cages like that fill up top to bottom with mud 
uh, and it kills everything that's it, it insulates them and it kills everything that's growing on them or in them so they come out squeaky clean in the wow, spring that's pretty good so here's another thing i didn't mention i don't know if they're i don't think marine fisheries has a research license maine has real small scale i think it's like 200 square feet uh experimental permits that are real easy to get and new hampshire has the same um you know the issue is you can't sell the product at the end in new hampshire you can in maine i don't think massachusetts has anything like that not to do with oysters <laughs> yeah but it would be i mean to put out something real small scale just to see how they do 10 cages like that would be fascinating and it would it would it would answer a lot of these questions about you know public perception and safety issues uh and you can navigate all those pretty easily there's been some, there's been some guys who've done it on and off in raleigh with, with different methods i yep. don't feel aware of that i, I think there's somebody who's got some plan in the works in raleigh is what yeah. i heard so i'd heard yeah i'd heard the kind of come and gone uh, but i've never seen an oyster from Raleigh, so I, I wasn't sure about that, but that's good, good to know. Is it Brunstrom? Is that? No, he, it's a different guy now. Okay. Well, yeah, but he Brunstrom used to grow them on his clam nets. Okay. You know, like larger seed, expensive larger seed, put them out for one season. Most of his stuff would grow in one season up on, on the mesh on top of his clams. Yes. Yeah. So he would just, he's collecting wild spat? No, he's buying large. Okay. Buying thumbnails for mm -hmm. ten cents or something like that, and yep. put them out there on, on his lease on on the clams, and no no bags, nothing, and then just go out and turn them over and rake them around a couple times during the summer, yep. and by fall the market size. Huh. Wow. Well, we better get on this quick before rally. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't I think there's punch. somebody else in the process of getting permits and um, yeah. having a hard time, you know, with the town conservation and stuff. I think yeah. the I think there's somebody who's approved. I don't know. I think they've been chasing that a long time. No, uh, an oyster farming operation. I haven't seen anything in the paper. You would think the press would be. Yeah, all somebody talking on a farm stand. That's all I know. Yeah. I don't know. I think the hardest part would be uh, Jeff Kennedy. I'm afraid that what he would do is say, "Okay, that's now in four point X," and because you just as you and I said, you're so afraid of somebody getting sick. Yeah. And of course, real mark. He's. They've redistricted yeah, our. They've, they've threatened to move that line down to the yeah. reef for, yeah. for the last 10 well, years. Well, now they've right? made the reef, mud ditch, and Doles Island a separate entity, and, and the Rowley River. Right. So they can close that without closing the rest of the Kennedy and parts of N4 a couple of years ago mm -hmm. after a rainstorm. Got some funny counts. But you know, <coughs> if you need. We have. The stuff, and you can probably get it from the state just as easily as we have it. But the all the water tests that they do, yep. at the end of the year we get the whole packet, and it, it says where they took their test from. They take it to Cottage Road, Upriver, all the way over to Pavilion Beach and Ipswich. So if you need those, uh, that'd help you. Well, just to uh, unless there is a question, I mean, from my perspective, to close thing close things out, the next thing I would need to do anything. I mean, it's basically now in your hands, I think. Like, I've made a presentation yep. to the town, and the next step, I believe, and I, I want to talk a little bit more to Jeff or someone else at DMF, would be to get a letter from the Board of Selectmen saying, we're prepared to move forward. And I understand you're not there uh, right now. Um, but, you know, the... You know, you know where I am, and um, you know I wait to hear from you at this point in terms of level of interest and where you'd like to see this all go. And you know, happy to work with you to the extent that I can. But really appreciate you all coming out. Well, if they did, if they did, uh, we got someone new and they changed the line or whatever. Would you be looking for a different? able to be maybe use a different area instead of being by the boulders is that something that you could oh yeah i you know I, what i'm trying to say absolutely yeah. so you're, you're like away from everybody almost yep i mean uh, i haven't really looked to be on that little yellow sliver because i see red and i just stop but 
now now that I know that you're trying to get open up to the railroad bridge, it's you know, it's worth an, another look for sure. Um, and you're looking at permitting on a year to year basis, or is this like a five year lease type thing? Or the list is up there. No, you, no. Uh, usually that's that's up to the town. And there could be more if they, the are, are, if they you, spawn in. Uh, in New Hampshire, you have the option of doing a year to year or a five year license. You know, it's well, that, since it's a three year grow out, it doesn't make much sense to go into it thinking that you won't be able to renew your. So if you did it, did, for they, a did year, they see those yeah. ones? Well, we gave you a yearly permit, and then That's the, that was going to be my question. But you said they were all certified. Yep. Yeah. Say sorry, and you'd be all right with that. Um, you wouldn't be happy, I know, but it, I would say if that were a possibility, if we felt like we were going into this and it was really uh, a trial case, I would be happy to do it on a really small scale, um, but not happy to go in and lose my shirt. No, I just wondered what you were scale. looking yeah. down the road. I think, I think you, you know, the more we're talking here, the more I think it would be great to figure out a way to put 20 of these out and see how they do uh, and see how people react. That's what I was going to um, How many would you put out if you had carte blanche? What would you want to put in there? So this this site, I think, can hold uh, about, I'm going to, a big wide range here, half a million to a million oysters. And you expect to, if you're doing great, you get back 30 to 40% of those. But how many cages? That's you that's what I'm interested in. The oh, actual the number impact. of cages yeah. you could probably fit 500 of those. Those are on, triple on three acres. Maybe three. triple decker them. I think you'd have yeah. to do. I think in Massachusetts, because of the core regs here, you have to do double stacks. Sure. You have a. I think that there's an 18 inch threshold or something like that. Which means it's going to be tough sometimes for intertidal boat traffic when the you know and here's. I'd make a suggestion. Selectmen, especially this selectman, deflect to their stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So these guys have opened up the ability for you to come in and talk to them. You're going to present a bank of knowledge that we don't have. Definitely. So I would suggest you've got some real qualified people in the room. You're looking yep. at you know some real qualified. I would continue not to wait for the town to give you anything because we're going to wait for the stakeholders gotcha yeah so i would work with the people that you've opened up communication with because then we have to go to the second tier as james said and bring it into a larger perspective of what is it going to do with people that use the river other than the people that are involved in clamming mm -hmm. so definitely if these stakeholders can see a way to use you, be part of their mission statement to make this a better river, yep. then that's why you should be talking to these guys. And this selectman anyway is gonna champion whatever the stakeholders feel for works and then go on to battle the next tier of folks that are stakeholders, <laughs> which are the voters, right, Jim? Right, so I appreciate that. Stay that's open great. with yeah. Peter and, and Paul and everyone and Charlie and Jeff and, and Alex and you know, because this is this is where you're going to build your support. Yeah. Okay. That uh, that's a great great thought on next steps.